I think there was a lot of jazz in San Francisco area. I mean, there, there's always been a good time, Charlie kind of atmosphere in San Francisco that the background gave to this. But I don't think the guys that started the jazz revival in San Francisco, Lou Waters and Turk Murphy and all the, and Clancy Hayes, um, I don't think they were directly drawing on any living tradition in this area. I think they, they were more like, they were mus professional musicians that were bored with their hotel gigs and they started messing around at night, all night long in a, in a, in a roadhouse in, uh, near Berkeley somewhere. And, and they found that they really enjoyed ensemble music. You see, with ensemble music, you can, with a small band, you, you play your, your own inventions all the time. You're not just reading off somebody else's charts. And um, so that's how it got going. Mm -hmm. And it came in with this, this record collector thing. That there, there's this collectors of the old records of the 1920s. Uh, it was a sort of a subterranean thing all over the United States in the, from the 30s onward. That's why I mentioned that as an influence on me and That's right. 20 years later in L.A. You know. um, each, each city had a, a one or two record stores that were like headquarters for the, these, uh, there were these moldy figs, you know. When I came out, we worked at Earthquake Magoons five nights a week and he frequently had uh, 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 one, one or possibly two other jobs during the week, like a little appearance somewhere before Magoons or a, some, a concert on a Sunday. And the money was pretty good in those days. I mean, it was in 1977, when I, I was living in Marin County, I, my rent was a, like $105 a month for a pretty nice one-bedroom apartment in Marin County. And, uh, you know, we were getting about, uh, with the work at Magoon's and one outside job week, maybe $300 a week, which by now, today's standards, that's barely scraping by, but that was a lot of money then. I mean, when you think about it, one, one third of one paycheck paid the whole month's rent. Mm -hmm. And that, that's, those, that, that was a pretty good ratio. I should say. Yeah. Well, everybody I, I talked to outside of this circle seems to have liked him tremendously as a person. Yeah, he, he was a much loved person, and uh, he, he knew everybody in town. I remember when I, he, the first thing, the first order of business was me was he had uh, take me out and get me a dark, we all had these band coats that we wore with black pants, and then this, what he called midnight blue, a midnight blue suit, and, which was a dark three-piece suit, which we wore on Tuesday and Wednesday. And then Thursday, Friday, Saturday would be, okay, we do the red coats, blue coats, tan coats, whatever. And uh, so he took me to Macy's down here on the square to buy my suit. And I remember he said, well, meet me. You know, I went to his house and we drove over. And he knew everybody. He knew the guy in the, in the, where he parked the car. He had a five minute conversation with that guy, the parking lot attendant. Everybody in the store knew him. He like the guy knew everybody in town. Mm -hmm. Then he took me to lunch, like a Tommy's joint. That place he used to <laughs> love. He used to love to go there. Everybody really? <laughs> you walk in, everybody knew him. You know, and he was he was one of those kind of San Francisco characters that everybody everybody knew. And uh, I, he knew I liked old sheet music and was interested in the history of things. So, you know, he let me go through all his old sheet music, and photocopy whatever I wanted. He was really good about all that kind of stuff. Yeah. I was in there talking to John Handy, and he was commenting on, on how much he admired his musicianship. Yes. He said he was really a fine musician. He was a great musician, you know, and, and people here, you know, he had a sort of blustery sound on the trombone, but that was his intent, you know. I mean, that's what I, um, people have asked, but well, how come he played the trombone? I said, because that's what he, that he played like that on purpose, you know. I mean. He, that was his interpretation of 
old-style jazz trombone playing. Well, you know, I was really fortunate because the only earthquake white magoons I really played full extensively at was 630 Clay Street, mm -hmm. which the was best. originally the Swiss Hotel, and um, it was almost Barbary Coast. It was it was around when the when at the bottom of of Clay Street at 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 uh, Columbus, it was actually waterfront, so it had been around a long, long time. But we never could uh, save the building when they decided to tear it down and build up a, a high rise. We never could save it. We had we had some legal people involved with it, um, a lawyer, but they they couldn't make it uh, they couldn't make it a historic site. Unfortunately, what was so special about that site? Uh, probably. The, the best thing about it, it, it seemed like it was designed for, for a good jazz band even before uh, they had jazz there. I mean, they had uh, polka music and things like that. You, you walked in on, on the street level, from the street level, and um, as you walked in the door, the bar was a long bar, and it was on your left. As you walked to the center of the room and turned to the, to the right and, and faced towards the the, the bandstand, uh, you saw that there was a there was a you might, it, there was actually a, a floor a lower floor, which was a dance floor. So you went you were actually on one level and and there was a there was a, a balcony uh, railing at this at this one level, and then you went downstairs on each side and you went down to the dance floor where you could where you could go from your seats and 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 go and dance or you could actually there was seating all around the dance floor as well. Besides that, you went upstairs, and there was a true mezzanine kind of level balcony up there where you could go up, and if you didn't want to dance, you wanted to hear the and see the band closely, and not not to, not to be bothered by too much of anybody else uh, uh, moving back and forth. Um, you you could go upstairs. Now, as far as musicians go, it was it was just an ideal place. It had a great sound. Uh, you know, a natural uh, uh, acoustical sound that uh, was was always uh, even with, with even with a powerful band like Turks Band, it still wasn't so loud for the room. It actually sounded good in, in at six thirty Clay Street. And many musicians that came through from from New York, like Yank Lawson and Billy Butterfield and the guys who were part of the world's greatest jazz band, said, you know, this is like something that we lost in New York when. When we lost all those good clubs in New York, uh, we really missed them. And he said, "This, I know Yank said this was the closest thing to the best clubs he ever played in. You know, he really enjoyed playing there. They all, everybody loved playing there." You you were talking on the BBC tape about you and Turk he, that he did sass for you. Well, sass is when we used to do double numbers, and in, in, in the blacks call it sass, like Butterbeans and Susie and all those black. Uh, um, duos, they used to say, like Turk and I used to do a number called Go Back, where you stayed last night, I don't want you no more. And he had another baby's my regular on, he'd say, what's the matter with me, honey, I'm right here. You know, all those kind of things. Well, that's called sass. You sass back and forth, you talk back and forth, so that was called sass. And we had several numbers that we did like that. Uh -huh. And uh, that's what it was called. And I en people enjoyed hearing those tunes. Uh. Well, I, that, that music, when I played in the band, was the best thing that ever happened. That's all I can say. As far as I'm concerned, I, I, had, I was very narrow-minded, too. I was very narrow-minded. And my, you know, as far as jazz, we had, I, I'll tell you this, back in the 70s, we felt we were the best jazz band in the world. In the world. And we were. We truly were. And we knew it. But we didn't, uh, we didn't flaunt it. And that's something that was... Uh, that Turk appreciated too, because he didn't like grand standards or showboating or play two choruses or three choruses, something to show you how well you play, you know, any of that. It was just the way we played and what we, we liked it. And uh, that's the appeal of that band. It was immediate, it was absolutely immediate. There was no fudging around. It's like you do it or you, you don't do it. And he persevered at that. Perseverance was the main thing for Turk's success, actually. He told me, if you persevere, you know, you finally get there. He said that. Yeah, he told me that. Mm -hmm. Persevere. Just keep persevering. And that's the thing. 